outcomes in refractive cataract surgery. So cataract surgery has become a totally refractive procedure where we want to achieve absolute hematropia, not just for distance, it's for distance and near. That means you have to get your biometry right, you have to get the spherical correction absolutely bang on, and we should also avoid or correct pre-existing astigmatism, avoid inducing astigmatisms, and we have to learn ways of correcting presbyopia at the end, the patient gets clear vision without any glasses. So there are multiple steps that take us there. So I'd like to welcome uh, all of you for this talk and I have Dr. Atik with me and Dr. Ramesh Dorrajan will be with us. So I think we'll just, uh, can we change the order? If you don't mind. Um, so I think what we need, you should, you should be first. So what we need to understand first to get the accuracy is getting your biometry right. Unless biometry is perfect and the calculations are perfect, the result may not be. So we'll just change it around and I'll ask Dr. Ramesh Durerajan to talk about the biometry do's and don'ts and the latest updates in biometry. Is that okay? Uh -huh. You can ask them to then. Others, can you ask them to put on the biometry talk first, please? Uh, Mohan, I, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Arun, like, I can open up here, it's not a problem. Okay, fine. They had to help me because this uh, this is jumping like like mad. He's doing it there. Oh, he got. <laughs> Thanks, Arul. So. Um, can I go ahead or because your mouse is still moving? Thank, thank you so much. So we have to start the talk by the greats in, in biometry, Dr. Warren Hill, Dr. Dr. Hagis, the only mathematician and non-ophthalmologist in this group. The Graham Barrett, we have, we, have, we have all used his formulae. Thomas Holson be, be below him and Dr. Jack Holliday. So, uh, sorry, that is Douglas Koch and, and this, is, uh, this is Olson. We know that the 2008 JCRS article by Savarkar and Norby told us that the common causes for biometry errors are as follows, and ELP estimation, that is formula error, is the a, is a, is a most important thing. Today we know that the earlier generation axial length error has largely been conquered because of the widespread use of optical biometry. Haig is four years ago, he, he, before he passed away, remarked that, that we cannot expect to have improvements in measurement of the axial length because now <laughs> pulsations in the eye caused by heartbeat can now be measured by uh, accurate uh, uh, optical biometry. In spite of all this, we have not reached 100% uh, per percent of our patients getting 20-20. Uh, Two years ago, Dr. Warren Hill in our, in our state conference gave a lecture where he said, if you are getting about 78 to 80 percent, you will get a pass mark. That is within 0.5 uh, diopter of error. And 92 percent plus is achievable by those doctors who concentrate on every step of biometry. If we continue to use manual keratometry in 0.5 steps, and we are using one of the early generation formula like SRK2 or T, we are probably at 70 percent plus. But if you switch over to SS OCT based biometry and one of the more recent formulae, which is all available free and online, you are going to get 90% plus. The advantages, so that is it, we have to switch over. If you want to have better results, we have to switch over for better acquisition of data. The machines have to be better and the formulae have to be better. Axial length is no longer the issue, but cornea is the issue and this has been extensively covered in the last few years, we have to optimize the cornea before, making, before taking the measurements of the cornea. The advantage of the newer generation biometers is that they are more accurate as far as cornea is concerned and we get a whole set of new parameters that we can measure. For example, we can get a true corneal power by, by OCT-based machines which are going to measure the front and back of cornea and they have, they reduce the common mistakes our optometrists make. Most of us are not doing the biometry ourselves. 
the mistake that the operator does is reduced because they have checkpoints which, which check for these, these errors. For example, here's a patient who had anti-VEGF injections in Tirchi who came to Chennai for a surgery. On the slit lamp, he just had a white cataract, but the optometrist picked up the small tear of the posterior capsule there because this shows up easily in the, in the uh, IOL muscle 700. So in this particular patient, we know before we take up the surgery in a white cataract that there's a tear of the posterior capsule. Then if, if, if your optometrist finds this kind of myers, she will know that you had asked the patient to blink. This is not, not good, good enough to do a calculation. You had to either make them blink, make it better, or you had to optimize the tear film. Very dense cataract, poor vision. We will easily miss this, uh, this macular hole unless we do an OCT for all of our dense cataracts. But this will be picked up by your new generation SS-based uh, optical biometers. Can I have uh, the next slide? The older formula, they're all one-line formula. They just had one-line calculation. This is a Hoffa Q, this is a Hagueis, one single line, which they apply to all eyes. Small eyes, large eyes, butthalmas, nanophthalmas, post classic. So the older formulas have, are all one-line formula applied to all eyes, and that, you know, will not work well for the uh, unusual eyes. The modern formula have different calculations in different situations. post has, has its own calculation. Catacornus has its own calculation. They're all multiple different formula depending on pre-op, whether you choose, which one you choose. The SRKT that many of us were using till 15 years ago is actually first described in 1990 based on a data set, small data set of 1,677 patients. Imagine 35 years ago, a very small group of Caucasian eyes were used to optimize SRK2 and T. But many of us are still uh, uh, depending on that. So we cannot get perfect results if we do that. The modern formula try to optimize every bit. For here, you have lens thickness. And this is called the power prediction curve. So in different formulas, they find that if you have a six millimeter lens, you're likely to get a more hyperopic result. So they'll write one line of code and they'll say lens thickness more than five. Please add a 0.25 and flatten the curve. So what they do is they take each segment, corneal power, ACD, white to white, lens thickness. These modern formula try to uh, uh, make the power prediction curve flat for each one of these lines. But it is not perfect, and it's not perfect because these product power prediction curves are based on a scatter plot. There are individual variations in any set of data. So even though you have a single straight line here, it doesn't mean that everybody is on plano. Some will be a 0.1, 0 0.2 above, and some will be a 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 diopter below the curve. The power prediction curve is just a mean of a large set of data. Because of issues also with IOLs being in 0.5 steps, and because of power measurement errors, which is possible, that is an intraocular lens, which the manufacturer thinks is a plus 20 lens. His machine shows plus 20. He is permitted, and the machines have an inbuilt measuring error of 0.18 standard with deviation 0.1. So a 0.2 error is, can, is there in the manufacturer at his machine end itself. He also does not know. These, machine, these small errors, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, can cancel each other, or they can submit, and once in a while, you will have a patient with unusual refractive result. So Douglas Koch in the CRST 2023 review said that 90% accuracy is probably our a ceiling given the current machines and the technology which we use. Patients must be informed they have a 1 in 10 chance of having a residual refractive error. We have to tell them this. The modern formula are mysterious black box solutions. We have no idea what is happening. We just feed in the data uh, online and something goes on behind that. They are all using cloud-based computing, not a, a small computer in, in some particular lab. This is modified from Warren Hill's famous uh, list of different kind of formula and, and what they, what they, and the set of eyes which they are good with. But here's the interesting part. I modified it. Evo, Kane, Pearl DGS, Hoffa QST, Full Monty, currently not available online. Nalla Swami, Kimura, Lada Super Formula, AA version. All these are new formulae, which are living formula. They are getting updated every three to six months, and they are improving. So among AI-based formulae, we have the pure AI, Hill RBF, Kamara, and the Nalla Swami, and the partial AI, Kane, Pearl DGS, Hoffa Cube. So which one of these various modern formulas is the best? This is a 2024 review by Sopera et al. seeing all the publications on AI-based formula. And they came, to the, they came to the conclusion that every surgeon who has done this formula thinks he's the best. But if you see those with, with large number of studies, Kane is the best. So if you want to use any one formula, please use a Kane formula. And all these formulas are going to improve time. They're not static formulas. They're all living formulas. 
Last week I had a patient who had a 0.75 error and he was implanted after, after Kane and Barrett's, they both gave the same sphere and cylinder. And post-surgery, pre-surgery, it was almost the same. The K was not much different. When I looked at his values, he had a long eye, 24 millimeter long eye. He had an unusually flat cornea, not post lasic The true K and the actual K were all 39, 40, flat cornea. Lens thickness, normal lens thickness is 4 millimeters, standard deviation 0.2. This is at 3.6. It's an unusually thin lens in a, in a, in a flat cornea and a long eye, and the formulas have, have, have not given me a, a, a proper result. Is gender a factor? After seeing more than two lakh eyes, Sabini et al. a few years ago came to the conclusion that males have longer eyes, flatter cornea. Gender is a factor. And the current generation formula like Kane and Hill RBF will ask you whether you are calculating for a lady or a male patient, and they will give you two different results based on that. Can we Indians use formula op optimized for Caucasian database or Chinese database? No. Indian corneas are steeper, our lenses are thinner than Caucasians. So truly, if we are uh, happy with one particular formula and one particular customized uh, 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 constant, if you're operating on a Chinese patient or a patient from, uh, who's Caucasian, we should modify it slightly. So in summary, to get good results, optimize the corneal surface, use a SS OCT-based biometer, use the Kane formula. Accept that one in 10 or one in 20 patient will have an error equal to or more than 0.5 diopter. Please inform the patient once in a while and you can expect further improvements. All this comes at a cost. The Iwell Master 700 before, before COVID cost us about 31 lakhs. Today he is listing it at 40 lakhs in just a few years. A, a, a few months ago, it was started giving the wrong date and he said he wants to change the battery. So when the technician came to change the battery, which uh, uh, powers the motherboard of the Iwell Master 700, he spent some time and he said it is stuck to the motherboard, the motherboard has to be changed. So he changed the motherboard instead of the, with the battery and he gave a bill for 6.28 lakhs. So individuals who want to use these machines have to be willing to accept this kind of uh, uh, cost or better to have group practices or use a common center and, and, and use the machines there. So we are at the cusp of understanding how better quality measurements and large population specific database will improve our power calculations. Things are at a flux. At present, use the Kane formula, where Kane is not applicable like in, uh, like in one want to do a lens rotation. Please use the Barrett's. Thank you. Uh, the patient which you showed, what formula did you use, sir? You had an error of 0.75. Both. So both Kane and the Barrett agreed for that particular patient. There is no, no difference in the eyeball power which they both, both suggested. So you, but the point is, even if you're using a very good formula, once in a while, in a year, two or three patients, or once in a while, you will have this. I'll throw another question at you. This particular patient who ended up with 0.75 off the mark, would you attribute it to the flat cornea or to the ELP of the lens is going to be different because the lens was thinner? That's what I was thinking, uh, Arul, and I really don't know. I think, no, they have enough data sets for the steep and, and, uh, exactly. and long guys. They don't have enough, enough exactly. data points for the small, thin uh, lenses. Exactly. So probably the lens portion is anterior. Because all these formula have been tweaked for post-LASIK, and they work brilliantly in post-LASIK because they have a flat cornea. So take out the flat cornea here. So what we can understand now, when you have a thinner lens, we can the chances of... Yeah, uh, getting oh, going a, off. myopic what? result is more. more. Make it one step weaker. Weaker, simple. Yes, yes, so, yes sir. In the no, same why don't you put up a paper on this? Who, a who? simple you, ah. a simple mathematical calculation <laughs> okay. saying with a Barrett Universal 2, for every 0.25 thinner lens from 4mm down, think of going one step, uh, one step down and then we publish it. <laughs> I hope we got, you got the thread of what we are talking about. So actually, it's very easy, very simple, but this is going to come, it has to be automatic in your mind, that whenever you see a patient, something goes wrong, you go back like a, you know, an animal that's going after its food to figure out what went wrong. So once you figure that out, then you're ready to face the next patient. But this has to become automatic. It can't just be left, oh, I just got this wrong, and this is normal, this is acceptable. Something goes wrong, 0.5, you have to dig into it, ferret into it, find out what, and then you will be able to understand these things better and get better results. So let's have the uh, next speaker. Now, we all do biometry, corneal, K1, K2, axial length. Does corneal topography allow you to get better results? Is that something that is really useful? 
And if it is useful, how do we make it useful? How do we go about it? We have Dr. Jayantan who will take us through that. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I'll be uh, talking on the topographic aspect of uh, our refractive cataract surgery. So this is a famous quote from the art of war. So according to the cataract surgeons, to get bang on every time with your results, you have two variables as uh, the most important point of this. The most talked of enemy would be the topography, I mean like keratometry values. So it helps us in pre-operative, post-operative, and future it is going to be the topography which is going to define all the questions that we have in our mind regarding the calculation errors. So to start with, we have certain technical pointers we need to understand. So we have an axial or a sagittal map, and we have a tangential map. So the basic difference is that the tangential map tends to exacerbate and magnify what you are normally seen on an axial or a sagittal. So this is actually very, very, very helpful when you are talking about a post-refractive surgery. As you could see, the left part is an axial map. This is a post-refractive surgery. The tangential map actually gives the size of the optical zone and the position of the optical zone in respective to the pupil. So it gives you more data, more answers to certain questions when we have a doubt post-operatively. The diopter scale of the map is also very important because when you have a larger diopter, you may tend to miss out on softer aspects of the cornea and if it is a very shorter steps, you will have two noisy maps, so it will be very difficult to understand. So having somewhere between 1 to 1.5 diopter step would be the right choice. So set these two things, look at the tangential map and set the diopter map uh, right before you interpret it in respect to the cataract surgery. So we'll start with the clinical pointers. Everyone knows if there's a scar, definitely it is going to affect. But what is the impact of this particular scar on your calculation will be told only by your topography. Similarly, a pterygium, whether to remove the pterygium or to do a pterygium after, I mean like uh, alongside or separately, uh, the effect of pterygium on the, on the cornea should be studied with a topography map. Ocular surface, when choosing the IOL, the first consideration is going to be a tear film. An irregular, unstable tear film will affect the biometric measurement of IOL power calculation. And after the surgery also, a poor film can degrade the quality of vision. So remember, if the myers are not crisp and clean, the validity of all the other measurements are going to be diminished. So this holds true for the auto -K. And the placido ring-based corneal topography will also be affected by the dry eye. So try to look at the myers when you are actually calculating whether it is an auto-K or a placido based rings. So even when you do an optical biometer, optical biometers like Linstar will be affected by the tear flame instability. As you could see here, the myers are irregular. And once you see a high standard deviation, it is always good to go and check the image quality before you validate these measurements. So the solution is going to be a topography, but the topography will give you a value. But remember, you need to treat the ocular surface before you do the surgery. Otherwise, postoperatively, the patient will be troubling you. The main thing is assessment of the corneal astigmatism. The topography may be used to assess the pattern of corneal astigmatism and the surface regularity. So the, it is useful for qualitative assessment of the cornea to know whether it is a regular, that is orthogonal or a symmetric bow type pattern, or an irregular, that is an asymmetric or a skewed bow type pattern. So this decides whether you are going to implant a toric or not. And next is a quantitative assessment. It depends on the surface regularity index, the surface asymmetry index, and the corneal higher order abrasion that is being derived from the topography. Right. Once you have a corneal astigmatism handy, the treatment options are the astigmatic incisions, LRIs, OCCs, and the toric IOLs. When it comes to the astigmatic in, uh, incisions, the cornea doesn't have access. Remember, it's just a meridian, and you need to place the uh, incision on steep meridian. And with the current understanding, putting it on a steep meridian, especially when you're operating a 2.2 mm or a 2.4 mm um, incision, temporally doesn't actually add much to the corneal astigmatism. So when you're planning a LRI or a killer corneal incision, the first thing is when you plan it, you need to plan where to uh, make the incision. So uh, you need to know the thickness of the cornea at the periphery where you are making an incision. Because if you are planning a 600 micron LRI, you cannot do when the cornea has got a 400 microns. So knowing where to place and the depth of the incision depends on your topographic values. And after doing a CCI, in case if you want to know how good is the effect on that particular cornea, you need to do the topography postoperatively to the node. So you need to design your own nomogram when it comes to the LRIs and CCIs. 
toric wells it's difficult to correct asymmetric bow tie patterns so you need to know whether the cornea is regular or irregular and remember the prevalence of irregular astigmatism is almost approximately 40% and this could be picked up only by a topography these are certain scientific evidences which says that uh, if a asymmetric bow tie has been corrected with the toric well the more the amount of asymmetry the lesser is going to be your outcome and uh, there are studies which says that irregular astigmatism can be corrected uh, with toric eye well if the central 4.5 mm has got a regular pattern so all these are done using a topography so only when you have a topography you can validate your measurement post operatively so to conclude all this to be more practical if the corneal astigmatism value obtained with the corneal topographer and any of your biometer if it is same then probably you can good you are good to go ahead with your toric eye well planning the next aspect of topography is that it gives a ekr value which is a holidays calculation so this will give you a value at every zone of the pupil 3 4 4.5 mm it is good to go with the 4.5 mm pupil and when you look at the distribution of ekr in the actual zones you can see whether this patient is good for a toric eye or not when you have a high peak at one point you will definitely have a good outcome as you can see here the mean of this cornea is 47 the peak is at 47.8 so naturally this patient will have a 0.75 outside even if you take a toric well but seeing the corneal astigmatism it is almost four diopters instead of leaving this patient with four diopters it is good to go with 0.75 even a residual is also fine but you need to explain to the patient beforehand and this is one example where for post refractive eye the peak is very good so this patient will definitely do good with your toric eye wells customizing eye wells uh, this is actually a role of by abrometry i think the others will be talking but still you can do with your topographer even if you don't have an abrometry remember your cornea will have a slight positive spherical aberration your natural lens will have a slight negative spherical aberration so the total is going to be slightly positive plus 0.1 once the cataract develops it's going to be high positive because the lens will become positive that's the reason why most of the cataract patient has got all these photopsic symptoms so when you are knocking off the lens with an eye well depending on the eye well spherical aberration your total eye uh, aberration will actually sp spherical aberration will change but uh, it could be plus minus or it could be a neutral one depending on the lens that you are going to choose okay so this calculation is valid only when the natural cornea spherical aberration is a constant but it is not going to be a constant so this could be measured using a topographer so one when you have a topography when you can measure the spherical aberration of the cornea because anyway you are going to knock off the lens so if you know that of a cornea you can tailor make your aspheric lens selection depending on the corneal topography's value and a special software program that has been used post refractive surgery is definitely it is a nightmare uh, this patient walked in for a cataract surgery this was the uh, uh, biometry values uh, usually when it is mathematically expressed so there are various wavefront abrometers uh, present some of them do only abrometry alone some of them also give you corneal topography as well i will be uh, restricting my talk to eye trace as i have the most experience with that alone so let's start with one uh, let's go with pre operative planning so how can abrometry help you in your pre operative planning for your patient who are going to going to undergo a cataract surgery so as you see as you know when you're using premium eye wells good centration of the eye well is a paramount factor to give you a successful refractive outcome in diffractive multifocal eye wells if a patient has a large angle alpha or angle kappa you know that that decentration can reduce the optical quality so excluding such patients from your premium eye well practice could be a good uh, way to go about it so also even if the angle the kappa is also large this can also uh, give you sub uh, standard results so the abrometers when we use them we can also measure the amount of angle alpha and angle kappa the eye trace does this very well an angle alpha less than 0.3 mm is supposed to be ideal 0.3 to 0.5 you have to be a little careful more than 0.5 is a patient who has to be excluded from premium eye wells completely so here is an example of a patient who has a normal angle alpha angle kappa so as you see here in both both of these scans both are within 0.3 mm of each other which means that the patient is a good candidate for premium eye wells whereas as this patient has a large angle alpha and a large angle kappa so for this patient a premium eye well might not be the best option as they will be looking through the diffractive rings per se so let's go by a case by case basis so this is a, a patient who is a 59 year old male best corrected vision in the one eye was 66 uh, in eight so this little lamb examination he really did not have that much of cataract he just had nucleus sclerosis so little bit of posterior subcapsular cataract but for this patient as we see here when you look at the eye trace images 
the, what the eye trace does is it even actually breaks down the optical systems. It tells you the aberrations in the cornea, it tells you the aberrations in the lens, and also gives you the total eye aberrations as well. So the first part is the aberrations in the cornea. It's given by a simulated E chart. It tells you how the patient is looking at the lens letters E and tells you how distorted it is. But as you see here, if we go to the internal E chart, it is very distorted, which means the patient has an aberration in the optical lens system, which means that this patient is a patient who needs a cataract surgery sooner than later. So this can help you in a decision making on when to do your cataract surgery also. Case two, this is an um, anesthetist who also had the same issue. The vision was quite good, 6'6", six, 6'9", six, 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 but she had some posterior subcapsular cataract. As you, as you can see here, the preoperative aberrometry in the first uh, picture there, it shows that the internal lens aberrations is a little high. So it means that the patient is having a lot of um, uh, optical image quality disturbance because of aberrations. And the second image, as you see here, after the cataract surgery, her aber aberrations have improved and the optical quality of the E chart is now up to 10. So which means the image quality has drastically improved from before to after the surgery. It can also help you in ocular surface inflammation. So as you know, we all know, dry eye is a multifactorial disease characterized by inflammation of the, uh, of the ocular surface which gives rise to an irregular tear film. So this can also affect the quality of vision. So this is a patient who underwent flax with the premium eye placement in both eyes. She was um, having unneeded vision of 6, 6 and 6, but her TBT scores were um, very low. She was put on um, an, um, a protocol for dry eye uh, disorders with oral doxycycline, omega-3 fatty acids and lubricating drops and observed after six weeks. And she also underwent lipid flow treatment. And as you can see here in the analysis, we see that her glands are very badly dropped out with a lot of MGD. And this is the change analysis after treatment of dry eye. So as you see in the first uh, slide, the corneal aberrations are high. Lens aberrations are okay, it's still around 8.9, but the eye trace clearly tells us the issue with the optical system is in the cornea. So after we treat the um, uh, dry eye in a, a dis disorder with lubricants and doxycycline and anti-inflammatories, the image quality has improved a lot and the um, uh, aberrations have all come down. And now the e-chart shows us an optical quality of 10 out of 10. This is the same patient. As you can see, this is a, break, um, a breakdown of all the aberrations in the eye. She had a lot of uh, coma, trifoil in the um, internal um, aberrations uh, parameters, which means the corneal aberrations are very high. But after treatment with the dry eye, they have all come down. So this, this just goes to show how the eye trace or other aberrometers can tell you which, where the pathology is, whether it is corneal, whether it is the lens, or whether it is internal. And you can come to a diagnosis and, and treat the patient appropriately. It also gives you this, this is called modulation transfer function. It describes how the objects are obtained in the form of an image in the lens. Basically, if a, way, a ray of light passes through the optical system, it sees the amount of spread that is happening in the optical system and it characterizes as a uh, factor of modulation transfer function. So this can also be termed as contrast sensitivity. So in the left is a patient with a cataract. As you can see here, they have lesser uh, MTF. At 10 cycles per degree, it is less than 40%. But after surgery, it has improved to the normal one, which is above 40%. So this is the MTF before and after the patient when they had an EDOF IOL placed. So the, the left one, they have less contrast, and after the IOL is placed, the contrast has increased to the normal, more than 50%. So again, this is another patient who has had a monofocal lens placed, and it's expected the monofocal lens has the highest amount of MTF, or the highest contrast sensitivity, at about 60% at 10 cycles per degree. So you can also use this to track your outcomes with your different IOLs, so you can see which one has the best MTF, and you can uh, keep that IOL uh, choices in your armamentarium and choose the patients who need which IOL they want to. Another very useful one is called the potential visual complaints. So as you saw here, the previous um, uh, parameters had this balance letter E chart. So this is a simulation of the eye trace system and how the eye would see the projected E chart and it would tell you how, what potential visual complaints the patient could have. So this is another patient. 65-year-old who um, underwent the bilateral um, multifocal uh, IOL surgery, and now she had PCO. But her vision was not so bad per se. She had 6-6 uh, parts in 8, 6-9 in 8 in the other eye. Um, some PCO was there, not uh, very drastic, but there was some capsular wrinkling. But then you look at the MTF. So you see here that the MTF, um, it tells you both in the cornea and the lens, there's a lot of aberrations which means that even though the PCO and the wrinkling was not so much, but 
because it's a multifocal IOL, these IOLs are very, very sensitive to even mild PCO or wrinkling. So this patient will really benefit from a yak capsulotomy. So if we see here again, we, we look down, there's something called as potential visual complaints. So this tells you how the patient is seeing the e-chart on the Snellens chart. So here a lot of blur, double vision, starburst, etc., which will degrade the quality of vision. So after the YAG, all of this went away, or at least it reduced uh, quite a bit. So after the YAG is over, all the potential complaints are gone, and the E-chart is a little more stable with better optical quality. Finally, it can also help you with toric IOL planning. So this is another patient who came with a 2.50 cylinder power, and he underwent a, a cataract surgery, and he placed a toric IOL. Evaluated on the post-op day five, he had a minus one cylinder left behind, but he had a little bit of optical quality disturbance, even though he was able to reach 6.6. If we took him to the eye trace, the eye trace also has this thing known as an toric IOL evaluator. It tells you if the toric IOL is placed on the correct axis. As you see here, she, um, they had some amount of um, starburst and uh, halos. And we look at the toric IOL calculator and it tells us that we were off axis and they required a rotation to the correct axis to uh, give back the patient the good quality of vision, even though the residual is only about minus one cylinder. So after this was done, the patient's complaints went away and they were on the way. So to conclude, Abrometry is a useful tool uh, when, uh, when uh, evaluating a patient for refractive cataract surgery. Helps you in your decision making in the pre-operative period. Can also be used to be uh, planned and you can see you track your outcomes with the IOLs. You know which IOL gives you what outcome. You can see the contrast sensitivity. And the wavefront abrometry can not only help you in the pre-op planning, but also can help you in post-op troubleshooting and help solve patients who are having those odd issues. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, that was really a very good exposition. It's quite important for us to understand what the patient is sometimes complaining of does not fall into what we are potentially observing. So it's common to see the case sheet that comes up to you where it says 69N8 or 66N6, but the patient is bitterly complaining of poor quality of vision. I can't see clearly. It's, everything is waxy. So when you do abrometry studies, that throws out as to what exactly is going wrong. One potential problem, a dry eye. Second potential problem, minimal PCO. Third potential problem, that is the quality of that particular multifocal eye oil or the of eye oil, where the MTF and contrast sensitivity is going to be low. So then when you start looking at all of these things and correct them, it is invaluable that you can find out the MTF of the lens inside the patient's eye, how it is behaving consistently, and that gives you an advantage of choosing the particular lens that is most useful in your practice. This is something that's absolutely invaluable. What the manufacturer says as an MTF on the optical bench can be subtly different as the MTF that this particular lens gives in the patient's eye. And if you have implanted 10 or 20 of these lenses and you have screened the MTF for every one of these patients and the MTF is good, then you know this lens can be put into any kind of a patient that walks into your practice and you can expect good results. If the MTF is consistently low in a particular lens model, then be ready that these patients, though they read N66, N6, if they are demanding patients, they are going to be unhappy. So there is a difference in cost in these lenses that give good MTF to poor MTF. So then you can start choosing these patients, non-demanding patients, older individuals, sedentary lifestyle. Then if they're going to be happy with the lower and multifocals, put that in. If you have an active patient who's driving and who's very particular about quality of vision, then you should push them towards the other end. Or if they're going to be too demanding, okay, give them the monofocal itself. So looking at the abro aberration study is just not the aberrations of the eye. You can use these abrometers to study the MTF of the lens. That's extremely important. Not many instruments give you this facility. Eye trace is one. So using it extensively can make a difference to your practice and more number of uh, satisfied patients. Any comments, uh, Ramesh or? Uh, uh, I think I have a question for you. So can you tell me, uh, does the MTF change depending on the pupil size? Does the lens MTF change depending on the small pupil, medium size? Does it change with uh, uh, background illumination? Uh, I'll answer that. Mm. The eye trace takes the reading with the standard, say, 3mm or 4mm pupil, whatever the patient has. But because the eye trace is also a topographer and an eye tracing, you can, on the machine, enlarge the pupil artificially. You can say, go to 5mm pupil, 6mm pupil. 
So it will tell you at 5 mm, 6 mm, 6 mm what will be the. So you can actually study the MTF of a particular lens or a system at different pupil sizes, though you've recorded it on one pupil size. So that again, it's a tool that can be used to give you excellent results. So there are no questions on aberrations, now we'll go systematically. We've done the biometry, we've done topography, then we've done the abrometry, we've done everything. That we still have to do a good surgery to get good results. So how do we go about doing the so-called perfect FACO? So yours truly will do that. Perfect FACO. The dream of every FACO surgeon is to get a pair of perfect FACO every time he does a surgery. Uh, when, when you want to get a perfect FACO done, I think I'll cut out the perfect, the cut the perfect. volume. I'll, I'll play. I I'll talk myself. Absolutely fine, and you should get a perfect job. That you want a perfect incision should be there. It should not only be perfect; it should be ergonomic. The incision length, not the width, should be at least 1.25. So you can take a caliper, mark it out, and mark 1.25 or 1.5 on the cornea. So then make a groove at the limbus, then stabilize the globe, and go forward and dip in at the point that you've made. So you're 100% sure every time that you do an incision, you'll get a perfect incision. You want the incision to be not shorter than one millimeter, not longer than 1.5. So mark out 1.25, it's very simple, anybody can do that. So you want good endothelial support, do the soft shell technique. Put in a high viscosity viscoelastic, and under that put HPMC on the surface of the lens, lens capsule. So the best CCC comes if you keep the tearing edge flat. If you flatten it, you'll get the best results. So don't let it bunch up. Keep it absolutely flat when you do the rexus. So that's very, very important. Most of us let the tearing edge bunch up and that, that completely messes up the, uh, your rexus. Not only that, you want the rexus to be of a perfect size. All you need to do on a slightly the dry cornea, take a ring marker, 5 mm marker, you can mark it. Of course, if you have the callisto or the varion, you can do the marking. But believe me, once you mark it on this uh, microscope, for about a couple of minutes, the marking is still visible even after you put HPMC. So now this is what I told you. Keep the tearing edge flat. Don't let it bunch up. Now you can follow the mark that you made on the cornea and make a perfectly sized, perfectly centered rexus, which is quite important to have perfect ELP as well as avoid any rotation that could occur early post-op or late post-op by contracture of the capsule. So this is very simple. Any one of us can do that. So that gives you a perfect incision, a perfect rexus. A perfect hydro is important because you want to be able to rotate and you want to have minimal amount of visco I mean, uh, cortex left. If you want a good hydro, please shallow the AC before hydro. If the AC is overfilled, then the fluid will not go in. There's no space. Shallow the AC, go in, lift up the rexus margin, free of the cortex, and then inject in that exact plane. Don't inject into the cortical mass. That's what we most often do. Once you do that, you've done a perfect cortical cleaving hydrosis section, which makes your cortex removal in the end very easy. 90% of the time, 9 out of 10, you will find that everything comes out. You don't even have to do an IA. So we've gone to good hydro resection. What will it tell you? So let out viscoelastic, go under, lift it up. Don't disturb the cortex. The cortex is completely undisturbed. Then you inject in that particular plane. You'll get a perfect hydro resection. Decompress. Hydro resect inferiorly, decompress superiorly. So even if you're left with cortical remnant, it will come out very easily with an IA in a matter of seconds. You don't have to go around fishing around. So perfect hydro not only helps you rotate, but also completely reduce the amount of cortex that you left out. How do you get the perfect chop? Very simple again. So what you should do, step one, clear the rexus area of all 
epinucleus, and cortex. That's important. At the upper one-third of the rex's area, make a 2 mm punch with your FACO. Now they take the chopper. Place the chopper right in front, absolutely centered in front. FACO deep in, hold with vacuum, dig in, move both instruments towards each other with a short burst of FACO and separate. The chopper occurs like magic with no effort whatsoever, even in a hard cataract, as I will show you. This is a firm cataract. I would say a grade two to grade three, nothing great. Getting a decent chop here is quite a bit easy. Hold, separate, and emulsify. Try chopping into smaller bits as you go on. So make a 2 mm punch on top. Take the chopper right opposite to it. Bury deep in and separate where you are into the middle of the nucleus, both in the x, y, and the z axis. This is important. Make the so your FACO holes into the nucleus, not into the epinucleus, because you've removed. So here we have a really hard cataract. I've done all of this. Now go in. Now we are in two and a half millimeters into the lens. Hold it, do a small burst of FACO, and even that hard cataract will crack with minimal effort. Separate down right to the base with the same hold, you can do the second chop. If it loosens, go back, do a small burst of echo, hold. It's important that the piece is held very, very well by vacuum before you attempt to separate the pieces. Once you've done that, take out all loose pieces. Don't let any loose pieces hang around there. There's no hurry to do anything at all. Take your time, separate the pieces, loosen them. Don't traumatize the zonules in a hard cataract. Make sure that all the... the cortical attachments are completely broken up before yanking the piece out of the bag. Trying to pull the piece out of the bag when the cortical remnants are still attached at the bottom will put stress on the zonules and cause a lot of problem. So when you do this, you'll get a perfect chop nine times out of 10 or 10 times out of 10. It is just using basic physics knowledge and holding it. So you've done the perfect incision, the perfect rexis, perfect hydro, done the perfect chop. So you should get the perfect results also. So that's it. Any questions? Watching you uh, do FACO for about 20 years, and uh, as you age, it's getting better. How is it, sir? <laughs> uh, no, unless I, I believe in one thing. Um, the moment you stop plateauing, stop practicing. Practice it. And there's no room to plateau. If you go back and look at your one-year-old video and you feel satisfied, give up your practice. You had to keep improving. If your one-year-old video f makes you feel ashamed, then you're ready to keep going. Your three-month video tells you that you could do better, then you're on, on course. So don't go by age. Uh, Arul, one more thing. Uh, you had an unusual FACO tip, box tip. Okay, okay. <laughs> and, okay. and also one more question. For the nearly, really hard ones, you are using the longer choppers. Yes, uh, those choppers are designed by me. They have a special uh, angulation. Uh, the tips are my design. Uh, they are actually patented. We are trying to talk to some of the international companies to take it up. This is a pentagon shape. It's not square. It's a pentagon. It's got a completely different uh, architecture internally and externally which makes the holding very efficient as well as the emulsification. The difference in the EPT between the standard tips of even the uh, standard companies is about 30 to 40 percent lesser EPT. We have proven that. We've done enough studies. So that's something we're still in the marketing stage. How much FACO? Vacuum. 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 OK, that uh, will depend entirely on the size of your tip and the ability of your machine. So to get a decent chop in a hard cataract, you should be between 350 to 650. If you're using a narrower bore, you can go higher vacuum. 
If you're using a wider bore, then keep the vacuum down. Because the more, the, uh, the, the higher the bore, the vacuum is more efficient. Smaller the bore, the vacuum is less efficient. So that's how you go. So it depends on the safety margin of your machine and the tip that you're using. Next one is the question is like in uh, certain softer cataracts or dioptic cataracts where it's sticky. Does this technique, uh, if you have difficulties in chopping, what is an alternative technique? Exactly. In these we'll come to that now. That is where in different rates of cataract you have to have different levels of <laughs> flow rate and vacuum. So then you'll have to have, see what happens when you have a soft cataract, when you have a high flow rate of 40 and a vacuum of 400, before you bury the whole thing is sucked out and you, you have no, nothing to hold, you're bowling it out. So then you'll have to have low flow and low vacuum. So I don't feel comfortable setting multiple settings on my machine saying go to low flow, low vacuum. So both flow, vacuum and energy are linear on my machine. So when I go down to position two, though my flow rate could be 40, at the top of position two, my flow rate is only 20. If I get occlusion at 20, my vacuum starts to build up. My vacuum will not go to 600, though my preset vacuum is 600. It will only go to about 100, 150 because I'm at the top level. Agreed? So you'll have to look at what you're doing, and when you get enough hold, chop immediately. So by titrating your foot pedal, the question asked often is, how can you do that? It's not possible. No. We all drive a car. You want to go slow, you could put the accelerator down a little bit. You want to inch forward in traffic. You want to stop. You stop, go down, come up. It's the same thing. There's no difference with the accelerator and your foot pedal on your FACO. As long as you understand where you are and what you're doing. So I set everything linear, so I have no difficulty whether it's a soft cataract or hard cataract. I, I'm not a fan of trying to have different settings, four different settings, then tell me, uh, my staff nurse or my theater boy, go to setting one, they're setting two. I don't think that... Uh, one more small comment. So one, one tip which I learned uh, about three, four years back, one tip which I learned in soft cataract is, we have to do, do two uh, uh, hydros. If you separate the nucleus from the epinucleus and do a, and do a two-step hydro, it becomes very easy. So do a hydro dissection, do a hydro delineation. You fake out the inner part, whatever you want, bowl it, whatever. <coughs> the rest you can aspirate. When we try to do the standard chop, it's more difficult. You need a very high level of skill. It's not under control. So do two hydros for them. It becomes so simple. That was a brilliant answer. You uh, planning different in a case where you have a central disc, also a leathery cataract. Leathery cataract and also a central attached disc. See, the disc is not so difficult to remove. The peripheral leathery part is always sticky. It's like a nougat chocolate. You can't chop it, you can't separate it. So in those kind of situations, take out the central core. It will come out like a kernel. Once it comes off, it's a little bit easier. You have more room to maneuver to hold the leathery part. And there, you'll have to really stretch a bit. Keep on stretching till it tears to the bottom. So if, if you have a leather, central hard core and a leathery uh, covering uh, epinucleus, if wherever possible, take out the kernel. It makes your job much easier. So we'll go on to the next one. Now, Sir. you've done everything perfect. Sir, how to reduce the surgical induced astigmatism? How do you? Surgically uh, induced astigmatism. How, to how do you prevent that? induced astigmatism? Exactly what I meant. I'm sorry, I should have been more uh, elaborate. If your incision is limbal, if it is temporal, and if it is going to be about one and a half millimeters in length, you are not going to induce any astigmatism. Whatever induces somewhere in the region of 0.12 diopters. So don't worry. It is when you move the incision away from the temporal side to either inferior, which you never do, but you go superior, you start inducing more astigmatism. Second mistake, you're not limbal, you go completely corneal. The more anterior you go, you will induce astigmatism. So stay temporal. Stay limbal, and the length of around one and a half millimeters, you will never induce any astigmatism, provided you have not burnt the wound. Huh? Width of the incision. Width of the incision, today most of us are at 2.4, but believe me, up to 2.8, you don't induce any astigmatism. Yes, yes, yes. It has been it has been validated on about two dozen uh, machines. 
What's the name? What's the name and where can... No, it's not available it? for sale. Eh? It is not available for sale because it is patented. I've given the design to an American company. They have patented it. They are in the process of marketing it. So it is not yet for sale. It is something new. It will soon come to the market. It has not marketed. No, no, no. No, nowhere, nowhere in the world. I, I am I'm using it. In future, we can get that. In future, yes, 100%, 100%. So what will be the name of that? Uh, it will be probably called Pentagon Tip. Pentagon Tip. Pentagon Tip, tip yeah. So we've done everything right, but you have an unhappy patient. So we will have Dr. Atik who's going to take us to analyzing what do you do when you have an unhappy patient. Uh, thank you, sir. It's always a pleasure to uh, share the podium with my uh, mentor. And uh, uh, going forward, just a continuation of the previous uh, talk, what sir said, uh, I had an assumption that I had reasonable knowledge about FACO dynamics. Last week, I took a, a demo from uh, a company, and the chamber was not at all forming, and I had a nightmare doing the surgery. I tried to play with the uh, inflow, outflow, change the bottle height, but uh, nothing seems to work. But what actually was happening was, I had kept my FACO that demo FACO machine on a different table. That table height was lower than my patient's table height. So I was struggling. So this I identified after two days. And then when I changed the height of that table, the machine started behaving differently. And then I compared the inflow tubing size between my old machine and what was given recently. There was a huge change in difference. So again, all, uh, these things also needs to be taken into consideration. Just knowledge of doing FACO and learning is not enough. These are subtle things which you keep learning on the go. So uh, thank you so much. My uh, uh, Due to want of time, I'll have to skip few uh, slides. And uh, most of my uh, this talk has already been given by uh, Jayantan and uh, Adit. Uh, so why do we have uh, issues post cataract surgery? I will say majority of the reason is because of us. About 20 years back, when someone had a cataract surgery, all they wanted to see was slightly better than how they were seeing before surgery. Then we told them you will see 66N6. Then we told them you will see 66N6 and you will see intermediate vision also. Then we started telling them it will be painless. There will be no injection. You can walk into the operating room from your car. Straight away get into your car and go back home. Then we also started telling them we'll give it to you in cashless. And some patients saying even the coffee that they purchased today should be included in the insurance bill. So why patients are unhappy, the reason is here not the patient. We have raised the expectation and the bar so much that our patients are expecting, after cataract surgery, they expect the diabetes, hypertension, retinal problem, thyroid eye disease, everything to be uh, cured after cataract surgery. So first, we should start promising less. And our patients typically have this expectation. They expect a Mona Lisa, but they want to pay uh, maybe 5,000 rupees, 6,000 rupees. And they say, in that hospital they're doing for 5,000, I want you also to do for that, pro uh, that uh, value. And this is something we see day in and day out. 6-6, six, six, N-6, six, the old man is extremely unhappy. He says, sir, he wants to come and meet you. They come and meet you almost every alternate day. And uh, this thing goes on and on. So to begin with, set the tone right. Give the patient realistic expectations, be safe, and don't feel sorry later on. So common complaints which happens when we talk of premium IOLs are, patient says everything is blurred, I see glare, I see halos, and uh, symptoms of dry eye. Most of this happens because we all know that when we implant a lens with zonal optics, I mean even the latest generation EDOF lenses, do have zonal optics, and it does reduce the contrast sensitivity by a little percentage. A really wonderful presentation by Adit on how he showed different lenses uh, reduce it. Maybe you can do a publication on comparing different uh, lenses, how actually the patients uh, see. I don't think there's not much data available as of now. It will be really wonderful. But what I see in my practice is Chennai is, some, uh, is a place where there is absolutely no water, but most of our patients come to us and say, in Tamil, sir, tanni vardu. So it is watering, 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 watering. This is what they usually uh, come with. So once the MGD is treated, most patients feel happy about it. 
So a little bit on, on, on science, why these multifocal lenses or the so-called bifocals which were there before were not performing ideally. The reason is very simple. Initially, the rings which were there were all with fixed height and the distance also were kind of reasonably fixed. With the current generation trifocals, if you see, the height is different and the space between the rings also is different. In short, what happens is they've started playing with the amount of light distribution for distance intermediate and near. That is all is happening. Initially, the distribution was for distance and near and some amount of light loss. Now, they've started, courtesy all these technological advancements, what they've done, what is actually happening is more amount of light distribution is moving towards for distance, less for near and intermediate. In short, don't implant the older generation bifocals which were there, move towards the trifocal lenses where we have less amount of glare, less halos, because the height of these uh, segments which I showed earlier have been reduced. So due to want of time, we'll have to uh, skip this uh, uh, things. So this is what is happening. Uh, distance has become more dominant. Near and intermediate, they've started giving less importance to. So the light distribution with the current generation aid of lenses is way better. So that is what is happening. That is why they have less complaints of glare and halos. So in short, move towards trifocals. It's time we stop implanting bifocal lenses which have fixed ridges which are quite tall, where the patient has excellent vision for distance, excellent vision for near, but then the photic phenomenon takes over and they are never happy. This is something, again, we see day in and day out, dysphotopsias. We have negative, where the patient says what they are not seeing, and positive dysphotopsias, where they say they see either glare or everything appears blurry, starbursts or light appears to be cracked, and then halos around light. So again, in short, these are exacerbated, exacerbated by certain conditions. The most common is PCO. Again, Adit had a wonderful case presentation on that. So even if there is minimal PC wrinkling or uh, there is minimal PCO, yag it. Because already there is a loss in contrast sensitivity with all lenses with zonal optics. So even with the minimum PCO, it gets affected. So yag these patients. So alpha angle, again, enough and more has been discussed. In short, if patient has angle kappa of more than 0.5, do not implant these lenses. So what happens when you implant this? Here you can see the central ring is totally decentered. The patient will be seeing through these ridges. Once the patient sees through these ridges, you're gone. So that is where problem happens. So any patient with a large angle kappa, do not implant any lens with zonal optics. So without doing this workup, going and implanting these lenses is not advisable. Another issue is, off late you would have seen representatives come and tell us, my lens is pupil independent when they talk of premium lenses. I'm sorry, I don't agree to that. There is no lens with zonal optics which is truly pupil independent. It becomes less, less dependent, but not truly independent. The reason being, the central zone in most lenses is for near, and then we have the distance and intermediate zone. So what happens when the central zone becomes four, or the pupil size changes? If the patient has a large pupil, and the central zone is just four mm, they will have poor near and intermediate vision. At the same time, if the pupil size is larger, and the central zone is four, they won't see much of uh, 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 distant vision because they are seeing through the near segment. So any patient with a very small pupil, it is not advisable to put in any of these premium lenses. So centration of the IOL is very important. It is a myth that the lens will sit where you place it. The lens will sit where it is intended to be sitting. So it, it sits based on the zonules and the architecture of the eye, not based on where you place, adjusting on Perkinje images. All that is a myth of late. So again, in short, if a patient has higher order aberrations more than 0.3 or 0.4, do not implant any of these lenses with rings. If you have a, a abrometer, it's wonderful. Even the topographers will give the corneal higher order aberrations. If it is less than 0.5, you can consider. But more than 0.5, strict no. <coughs> uh, biometry, again, I've been listening to this talk by Adi, sir, for quite some time. 
Uh, five years back, he said Barrett is the best, and then he said Kane. Now I've listened to Nallasamy. So every year, Biometry and RD Sir will keep evolving. So please come and listen to him. There'll be something new to uh, take home from that uh, talk. So biometry is extremely important. So last, when you have an imp uh, when you have an irregular tear film, you have to op optimize it. Do a yak cap even if there is a mild uh, PCO. One more thing which uh, I am uh, tending to realize of late is many a time patients come to complain, they just want you to listen. You just listen to them for 15, 20 minutes and say, okay, fine, and give them something. They feel happy and go out. But you get agitated and talk to them and say, you're reading 6, 6, N6, your defocus curve is so wonderful, they get irritated. So just like how a wife expects, listen to your patient, the patient will be happy at the end of surgery. Thank you so much. Sorry, Pratima. <laughs> I think that was wonderful. So, well, what is the role of flax in cataract surgery? It's been, you know, praised by some, it's been cursed by the most of the people and called, it's a total gimmick, doesn't work. Let's take it through. What does flax do? It can do an excellent CCC, it can soften the lens, it can do absolutely brilliant LRIs. It does reasonably good corneal incisions. That's, that's the story so far. So is it question, is it useful? Does it add value? Does it increase or decrease the surgeon's skill? Is it really useful to the patient? Again, the doubts are, at both extremes, it doesn't work. That's what the general uh, uh, understanding. It doesn't work in hard cataracts or mature cataracts. And it's not necessary for soft cataracts. We'll look at every one of these, two, these things. So, where's my video? Video's not coming up. Ah. So, yes. No, this is, you, you jumped many videos. There's only one that's coming up here. So all the, all the rest are not showing up, I think. On your left-hand side is one where we've done a flax. On your right, a similar kind of cataract where no flax has been done. Run both videos simultaneously. Run both together. Second Aldo will run. So you'll find that all the activities on the flax side is simpler. While I'm still struggling with the other one there, separate so easily. As as they separate, you find small bubbles coming out. What does that signify? That the laser penetrated through that hard, mature cataract right down to the bottom, and the bubbles are coming out from the bottom. So again, separation is so easy, while I'm struggling there on the other side. It takes much more effort. Here, simpler, as well as the lens is being softened. So outcomes. So see the way that the lens separates and comes out in the flax, while here, it doesn't separate at the bottom because it's really sticky. One has to spend a lot of time. No harm, fine, you can still get, do the surgery. But what is wrong in making the surgery easier for yourself, safer for the patient, and giving better outcomes? Should you have to struggle, and just because the technology is not widely available, is expensive, not affordable, is that the only reason to deride the technology? That's a question to be answered. If you ask me a question, is the cost that we are putting up on the patient justifiable for the results? It's a difficult question to answer. But is it better to the patient, better for the surgeon, better outcomes in the long run? There are no two things about it. You'll find here the surgery is over much quicker while I'm still struggling at the other end to complete the surgery. So let's go to the next slide. This is what shows up next morning. The eye that underwent flax, no SK, absolutely fine. The eye underwent flax, SK is there, 618. Yes, in about a week's time, it'll get better. But definitely endothelial cell count has gone down. How much it went down by, we do not know. We've operated probably on a 65 or a 70-year-old person. And if he's going to live another 20 years, is he, he or she going to have endothelial decompensation down the line? What about those questions to be answered? So in every way possible, it gives you benefit in hard brown cataracts. 
So again, I think we are skipping a couple of things. We'll uh, this is a very interesting case. We have done the flax through an ICL. There's an ICL with the cataract. The flax has been done through the ICL. So that also works. So the flax is done, the ICL is still in place. Then you can proceed to take out the ICL. The usual method, yank it out. Hand over hand, then proceed with the cataract surgery. So even in this kind of a situation, flax works. So I'll take it here. This is showing the flux procedure. Let's not go through that. This is again to show in an absolutely mature cataract. As you crack it, the bubbles come out. How did the bubbles get in there? Because the laser was able to penetrate even through an almost opaque cataract. So it works in that too. It's invaluable in subluxated cataracts and PPC. There's no way you can compare it to that. So we have, we have a PCC. In a PCC, we prefer not to do softening, just do the segmentation. So that makes it easier. You can even do a very, very gentle hydrodissection because the lens, the gas has already done a hydrodissection in a different plane. It doesn't go down to the bottom. So then you can start taking out the pieces very gently. The separation is good. You don't disturb the posterior block. We'll speed it up because we don't want to waste time for the next session. Uh, yeah. So out it comes. So that block that was sitting there was not disturbed by the flags. So FACO, what are the aims of FACO? We want less energy, less turbulence, less fluid, less time. And flax gives you every one of these. So it's faster, gentler, less trauma, less turbulence, better endothelial survival, less stress on the zonules. So in every way that it goes, it is good. We have heard statements being made in the past. As a first year DOPG, I attended my first AOS when we had an absolute, what shall I say, guru of ophthalmology stand up during a plenary session and exact words, it echoes in my mind. Please, please do not put this IOLs into human eyes. That was exactly in 1984. In 84, it was thought that putting IOLs into the human eyes was an abomination. Today, what are we doing? Do we still carry that forward for everything that comes different, a new technology, just because it's expensive? I have seen surgeons of today, top people, who will deride a technology saying, femtoflap is nothing, it's useless. A bladed flap is equally good. Until that given surgeon buys a femto machine, then suddenly femtoflap becomes great. That's pathetic. The improvements we're looking forward now are not large steps. The large steps are over. These increments are tiny. They are millimeter or micron levels of improvement. But outlandish amounts of money is being spent to get that small amount of improvement. That can be debated, but don't deride the technology and turn it down. Any technology that's come forward should be evaluated, looked forward dispassionately, and taken up, even if it hurts you, just for the sake the technology is better. Thank you. I think that'll do. We'll wind up before the other people throw us out.